You know when I knew that professional baseball was a different animal? And I was like, okay, this is different. Was so when I when I went to Great Falls, Montana, I started. Like I was start and then all of a sudden, I think I was in like 290 something. All of a sudden, I just I'm not playing a lot. And then I'm in my own head. I'm like, and then I'm like fighting for my life with pinch hits, which you know thing to do, a hard thing to do, man, and you have so much pressure. Finally I get a start in Missoula. Against the Brewers, mm -hmm. you know. If you did, you go. Yeah, yeah, we played up there. I go four for four. Actually, this is at home. Four for four with four doubles and six RBIs. I didn't play for a week after that. Yeah, and that comes from up top. That the managers only have so much say, right? When that happened to me, I said, "Oh my God!" Then I got to play. I hit a jack against the Rockies. I think they were somewhere in like uh, uh, Wyoming. Right? Wyoming, yeah. Long story short, I'm like, oh my god, like this is a, this is insane, and then, in some weird way, college baseball is like a more team game, mm -hmm. you know, like runner on second base, no outs, like I'm just I'm just trying to move the guy over, you know, get my guy to third and give him a chance. And then you realize in minor baseball, like you're not doing that, you're just you're just trying to put on a show for you. It's the and I didn't know how to do that. I'm a team guy, you know. Yeah. I was I wasn't always the best player on the field. I was a I was a really good athlete. Okay, I, and I just learned that I hit later on in my life. And I had power, but I was the team guy. You know, I was, you know, I was our team captain at FIU uh, my senior year. Uh, I, I was that guy. So I, I, you know, it was hard for me to make it about me. It's never been, I'm, it's. That's the big, di biggest difference from college and. And I didn't understand that. College and everything is about winning. You know, you, you compete. Miami's mentality is we're going <laughs> to compete against each other because you guys should be the best of the best. Yeah. You're going to make each other better. We're going to give you the resources, but we're going to let you go play. Right. Professional is about development. So when development trumps winning, you know, especially in, in the minor league levels, you're, you're going to have guys outwardly cheering against you because you're going for the same position. You know, you're going to have things that don't make sense that normally be like, hey, I just came from one of the best programs in college. And this is what we were doing. This is how I've been molded to now I'm in this arena where, you know, yeah, we want to win, but they want you to work on stuff yeah. and develop. And so I got caught in the whitewash of being a prospect and having a lot of coaches in your ear trying to work on things with hitting. Like, listen, I wasn't a big power guy. I had power. And I just never figured out how to repeat the power swing, but I was a very good contact hitter, speed and defense and stealing bases and being a table setter was my game. And so now I go in and I have roving hitting coaches, you know, telling me to like double the size of my stance and drop my hands and swing up because they see a particular big leaguer that I could prototype and-, and Or develop a knee that. kick. Right, yeah. You know, they had me doing a knee kick and I'm like, Dude, this is hard timing wise. So like I'm re reinventing myself after have done it, after have performing, you know, my swing thousands of times. Mm -hmm. And then God forbid you do it wrong, then Then you're gone. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's that's the big balance that I talk to a lot of players that I still talk to or work with um, from the financial side of things now is is you have to learn how to balance instruction. You know, you have to be coachable, you have to be respectful, but at the end of the day, you have to produce. And so there's a lot of coach there's a lot of great coaches out there. Okay. But then there's a lot of coaches out there that, you know, wanna attach their DNA to you because if you get to the big leagues, it looks good for their career development, right? And so you have to learn how to take coaching, take advice, but then at the same time, assess your own strengths and abilities, which is really hard to ask of like a 22, 23, 24 year old kid, because he's still learning, right? At Miami, we just reacted and played and we were taught the game at such a high level, but we just played. But now at the professional side, it's you know developing your approach and knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are. The best, best thing I could tell athletes is, from a hitting standpoint is, do things to maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. Because when you deal with the failure, 
you, you have to have a foundation to fall back on, right? And so if coaches come in and they're making you get in this crazy stance and hitting or you see something on TV, like if you're not comfortable, you're not going to be successful. If you're not swinging at the right pitches that are good for you, even if they are strikes, you're not going to be successful. And so I think being comfortable in, in, in how you're hitting or playing the game and knowing your approach and knowing your strengths and weaknesses, you know, it's, it's the old adage, you know, if I knew early on in my career what I knew later on, you know, maybe I'd still have a jersey on. It's, it's so true because you just, you, you, you don't, sometimes it's tough to get out of your own way. Yeah. Trying to be a perfectionist. Now that you say that, is, and, and, and looking back, I mean, for, for me, college baseball was obviously the best decision for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, I needed it for my own development. Junior college to me was where it really were. When I was at Dallas City Community College in Kansas, and I played for, I always say, the guy who changed my life, Mike Jones. Um, that that was something that I needed. Uh, because I was, again, I, I played football in, all through high school more than I did baseball. I, I, I showed up to the Miami-Dade County Senior All-Star game with football cleats, and the night before, I had been tackling Najee Davenport at Traspaw Stadium, okay? Was a beast. Try tackling Najee Davenport, bro. I, I was putting up a fight mm -hmm. with, with, my, with my other teammates, obviously. But you're on the financial advising side for players. You're around high school kids. You're around college kids. You're a guy who's been drafted twice. You play at St. Thomas. You play at the University of Miami. You play, you've played at the highest levels, Okay. When you, when, when you look at things now from the outside in, do you think for certain kids there is an advantage to maybe signing early and not going to college? Or do you think that there is... Or do you think... And, and, and the reason why I'm asking that is because you talk, and, I've, and, I, and I, I, I believe a lot in player development. But when you go to Miami, you got to win, right? Jim Morris makes a million dollars a year. Jim Morris has to win. Mm -hmm. At Miami, my friends always told me, you guys always told me, if you don't go to Omaha and win a national championship, it's, it's, it's a season to, is a failure, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about winning. It's all about now, right? Who's like, you know, one of the things I hate about college baseball is that Richard Giannotti this weekend is three for three, has a great series, has a midweek game, he's off. Friday night, he's off again. You may not play Saturday. Mm -hmm. Because somebody else may just, they kind of play the hot hands. That actually works <laughs> to your advantage, though, as a player, if you harness it correctly. I knew at Miami, if I was in a slump, that there was somebody on the bench that could take my job, and I didn't want to lose my job. Go back to the story of my junior high school. I was devastated. I just came from being the best player on the team to not even playing. And then all my dreams and aspirations of going to Miami or maybe playing professional baseball was just ripped away from me. So I'd already been through that, and I never wanted to go back to that again. And so I just competed, competed harder, competed harder. But not from a player development perspective. Yeah, that was probably more on the mental side. Correct. But, you know, take, take Do you think Miami prepared you mentally? For sure. For because, uh, because of the expectation and the standard of excellence? 100%. Because... I think it helped you understand how winning happens. Mm -hmm. You know, winning happens from discipline, from routine, from competition. Um, even though maybe the minor leagues is about development, I think if you have a winning mentality, I think all those other characteristics will help you get through the trials and tribulations of what comes along with putting development over winning. There's, there's, it's amazing you say that. I've, I've, and I'll use Miami as an example. So I, I signed a full scholarship at FIU. And I do remember Gino Damari uh, talking to me in, in, uh, when I was in, in junior college. He was out there uh, visiting and watching some Juco guys and whatnot. Um, and he, um, it, it was, you could tell they exuded, Miami exuded uh, uh, tradition, power, um, FIU was an up and coming school. The year I signed at FIU, you know, we had actually uh, Lewis had just pitched against Mark Pryor, and there, Miami. I if, remember watching. Yeah. It would have been the first first team to go to Omaha, but I saw a guy go. I saw guys go to Miami sometimes in certain cases that I know would not have made the starting lineup at FIU. But follow me here. Mm -hmm. They put on that uniform at the University of Miami, and it's like magic, dude. Something would happen, and. 
looking from the outside in, I feel that when you are in the winning environment, the standard of excellence, your mindset not your mindset transform transforms and you you all, now you carry this level of confidence that you didn't know you had. It's almost like you have to, you're in there. And it's why I'm a huge believer in environment. Totally. And when you look at winning, pro, like sometimes you'll see a kid play at a, you know, Coastal Carolina, you know, they up and down, right? Like FIU, up and down, up and down. Stud, right? Um, but he's not at Miami, but he could play at Miami, right? And then you see this kid that is a good, good player and he goes to Miami and it's like, what happened? Like this guy's now, now he's a stud. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think there's something about where you talk about a winning mentality that does something to like your brain where you just exude this confidence with how you carry yourself. You know, you're constantly wearing the green and orange with pride. It's a swag, uh, it's a little real. bit of good arrogance. It's great. No, it, it's really, it's important because. And I talk about Miami because it's in my backyard well, and I know you guys. Up, we all grew up here. But here's, but it, here's but the in thing corporations and, 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 and you see it in life. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing nobody talks about is it's very easy to kind of talk about the success stories. But everybody that came in to, to UM was the best of the best where they were from, right? We take a few California guys every couple of years, you know, but we had the best of the best around here or junior college guys like, like a Rixie um, who had a really good career at Miami. Mm -hmm. But the, for as many guys that I've seen come in and, and do exactly like you're saying, that the competition and the culture, the environment transform them into like superstars. I've seen enough of guys come in that were the best player in, in their in their state or their county and come in and not be used to having to compete because they were the man, the big man on campus in their high school. And if they never had to compete, then they kind of, the failure starts creeping in and I've seen them wash in and wash out, right? And so I think it takes a certain mental toughness. I think it takes a certain mental knowing you deserve to be there. But I also think it, it it goes along the lines of you know w w what what's in here. Like there used to be an old saying, like in order to be successful in baseball, you have to have hearts, guts, and nuts. That's what scouts used to tell us all the time. And I wanted to make sure I checked every one of those boxes. And so um, it, it's I think culture and environment is important, not just in sports. I think it's very important in sports because we spend so much downtime together. And we have so much failure that we have to get over in order to be successful. And I think that's very transferable in the business world. And I think a lot of business owners like to target former athletes because they have the competitive nature. They know how to work in a team setting. They know about discipline, routine, work ethic. And so I think a lot of those things transfer into the real world. The problem is, is, is the athlete ready mentally and emotionally to transfer into the real world and working world? that we're not really prepared for because we're still holding on for hopes and aspirations of making it to the big leagues. What was that like for you? It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Like we, we talked earlier before we started recording about depression and stuff like that. You know, I had my degree, you know, I went back in one off season, just knocked it out. So I had my degree, you know, I was nine years, nine and a half years in, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew it was time. <laughs> You know, I was a smart guy. I knew I always wanted to get involved in business um, after I was done. And and, I, and my goal, my dream was to be in business and stay around sports, right? Figure out a way to combine the two. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had a huge identity issue because take trivial matters like going into like Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, like, oh, there's my nephew who's the professional baseball player or your personal relationships. Oh, my boyfriend, this, you know, professional baseball player. Now all of a sudden I don't have that moniker anymore. <laughs> I feel like it, it was like stripped from me. And so emotionally, you know, internally I'm broken. A externally, you know, I was playing, playing in Miami and professional baseball. You're in the public scene. You want to show like, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good. You know, it didn't work out. You know, I'll move on. But internally, you're, you're broken. And so for me, you know, I've seen both sides of the coin, right? For me, I think I was fortunate enough to have met a lot of people throughout my career and, and living down here that I had opportunities. But 
just because there's a lot of guys out there that don't have opportunities and play like forever because oh, I'll just get into coaching. I don't have my degree. Like I had, I didn't have the situation. I had a lot of opportunities. My problem, which is a lot of guys can, I'm sure relate with is, you know, my mother worked 35 years as a flight attendant. My father worked 40 something years till the day he passed, you know, with the federal government. I was dealing with, oh my God, this next job I take is going to be the job I have to take for the next 30 years. And that paralyzed me to actually move forward and make a decision on what I wanted to do. And so I had opportunities with a major baseball agency because I thought I wanted to go that route. I had opportunities in uh, the front office and an entry level position with the Angels out in Arizona at the spring training facility. And then, you know, the financial advising one was kind of like the last one. Um, I had a really bad experience with my first financial advisor. Um, Guy never came to see me. Um, never picked up the phone call. I always had to talk to an assistant and then 2008 market crashes and I'm playing baseball. And all of a sudden, like I can't get a hold of anybody. There's no trust there. I just, I lose 35, 40% of my money. I pull out cause I panic. And this is a guy with a finance degree, but my lifestyle at the time didn't, didn't dictate watching the markets all the time and studying the markets. I was playing and trusting people. And so I, ne- I didn't make the, I made the mistake of pulling the money out and never getting back in. And, you know, those are mistakes that you live and learn from. And I think if you would have asked me in the middle of my career, would you be a financial advisor? I would tell you, hell no, those guys are terrible people. <laughs> I had a bad experience, but everything you learn along the way kind of said, well, I don't have to be like that. You know, I could be my own kind of person, my characteristics, my values that are important to me and, and start something around sports and use my financial background to, to help educate these guys so they don't make the same mistakes I made or other guys made. But if I circle back to like actual, the transition, I mean, I was, I was devastated, right? I just, my goal that I've had since I was four years old to play baseball professionally and to play in the big leagues and to make a lot of money to do good in the community, which is something I wanted was important to me with foundation work or, or, or the business side to be able to take your money, invest in saying real estate deals. And like that stuff was all exciting for me that were like aspects that come with being successful in baseball. And I just completely had it ripped out from me. Right. And so you have an identity issue. You have depression issue. I, I didn't want to go out of the house because I didn't want to have the conversation with somebody. Oh, when are you going to spring training? And be like, oh, you know, I, I'm I retired. I'm not playing anymore. I was terrified of that. And I'm a people person. And so to. Isn't it? Isn't it? Dude, it's 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 like we it's almost like we live the, both the same the, the same uh same story, man. It's and it's so common and it's and I think. And this is what this is the whole point of the podcast, and this is why I love having you guys on there, man. Because you guys, you guys all played, you guys were all successful, you guys all experienced success, failure. But, but I one of the th- one of the things that I think that the athlete somewhat makes, and I, and I, I think it's a little bit natural, and I think maybe it's imp- maybe it's important for for parents or or those advising to realize, man. It's you got to plant a seed early on, I think, uh, of letting these kids and, and these athletes know that they're not going to play forever, bro. You're just not. It's impossible. You know. You know. I always say, you know, Raúl Banyas played till he was 42. Mm-hmm. He's young, man. You know, Alex Rodriguez played till he was what 30, 39, 40, whatever his age was. They're young, and these are these are the best of the best, um, and. You know, as when when the rug gets pulled from underneath your feet in an instant, it's 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 tough, man. It's tough. And to hear and like you're saying, you don't even want to leave your house. I don't want to leave my house either. I'm like, what, Richard and my wife will vouch for this. I when when yesterday I told her again because when I was preparing my son. Uh, before the game and you know he was like doing his front toss and all that stuff and I'm like go take a shower daddy's take a shower before the game and you know that whole little routine I'm like baby you never met that guy (laughs) you didn't know that guy thankfully probably (laughs) (laughs) and she's like you know what well I love the guy that I met but um but yeah man it's that transition is devastating Mm -hmm. and it's emotionally hard actually sports I, I have a really good friend who's a sports psychologist you know they actually consider it almost a loss 
Tot- totally. It's like, it's like one of the stages of, of uh, grief. Of like grief. Of right? grief. Um, um, let's not take it so far. I mean, uh, the wide receiver for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Vincent Jackson. Yeah. Passed away. Same story. Guy was drinking himself to death at a, in a hotel room. Millionaire. Made and, millionaire. And a, and a great guy from everything I've read in the community. And, and he wasn't talking about it. Mm-hmm. He wasn't saying, guys, you know what? I'm not doing well. I'm not. I'm not healthy. I'm not in a good place. And it it goes back into this identity thing, you know. And that's for me where I say, you know, where I'm at in my life. I'm, you know, what I'm a child of God, and and, and that's who I am. And I wish I would have thought about. I I wish I would have had that faith anchored back back then. And it's not that I didn't believe in God or anything like that. It just you're just not aware, man. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just not aware. And I think it's important for coaches. Uh, and parents and those leading those 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 people who are around these athletes who have some sort of influence positive influence to remind these kids man you know what let's enjoy the process let's work our asses off let's go big Mm -hmm. but remember this is not who you are that's so you bring up a good point so i'll never forget a, a really good friend of mine important person in my life at the time when i was going early on in my career um said something to me that was you know baseball because everything in my life was about baseball oh no i can't go on this trip because i need to stay here and train oh no i can't go over here because i have to stay in my routine because this is what's going to make me better they told me baseball is what you do it does not define who you are and for me i had it reversed i had baseball is who i am and it just happens to be what i do and the reality is is no if you are not centered in your your values, your importance, the understanding of your identity is like, yeah, I'm a baseball player, but I'm also interested in art. I'm interested in writing. I'm interested in movies. It's okay. Like, I think athletes need to understand it's okay to like other things. Like, baseball, If even if you're professional, baseball doesn't have to consume 100% of your life. It just needs to be 100% of the focus when you're doing it and the time you allot for it because you do need healthy distractions or else those 0 for 12s turn into 0 for 30s, right, if you dwell on it. And so I think you need to have balance, right? Balance is a huge word with between hitting, playing the outfield, stealing bases, and even in life. You need to have healthy balance. And I think when I started really controlling the, the message in my own mind with um, understanding stress, accepting um, pressure, understanding that failure is not acceptable as long as you're learning from the failure and doing the right things with either meditating or you know working out to clear your head, knowing that you need healthy distractions in order to keep moving forward. Because I think a lot of times as athletes, we just think we need to go 120 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's just going to make me better because of work ethic, work ethic, work ethic. But you literally could be a hamster on the wheel just losing his mind. Instead of sometimes you need to step off the wheel, watch the wheel slow down, Till it finally stops and then say, okay, let me start over again, right? I'm not going to quit, but let me get back on the wheel and start going at a better pace and kind of like hit the pause button, say, let me get things back under control. Because if everything starts overwhelming you, it's just like the hitting analogy we said. If I'm not comfortable and I'm not swinging at the right pitches, I'm not going to be successful. Well, if you're not doing the things outside of the lines mentally to prepare yourself, uh, you're not going to be successful and and balance what, whatever your balance is you know is it doing a podcast to talk about your feelings it's hard for athletes to be vulnerable you know why because we've been cooked up our entire lives to tell us we're these great people this and that you're infallible you can't do any wrong they want to do all this stuff that when you do fall you have as many people pushing you down you suck like what's wrong with you you're going to get released you know, you're going to get traded you're no good anymore and so you have to be vulnerable. And I think by doing this podcast, I think you're, I think it's a healthy thing for you to talk about your experience. I think it's a healthy thing for me to talk. And I think it's a healthy thing for people watching that might be relating to one form of aspect that, that we're talking about to be like, oh, wow, I'm not alone. You know, there's other guys that have had success that deal with this stuff. And maybe they haven't like retired yet and had to deal with the transition. But the transition good or bad eruption all that stuff 
has a lot to do with the path that you take to get there. And so if you can start from an early age of having foundation and emotional um, stability and understanding how to deal with failure and understanding that baseball is what you do, it's not who you are, I think that leads to a more an easier transition. And I say that because I didn't take that path. I took the 24-7 165 miles an hour at a time until I got towards the end of my career where I started understanding these things. But for me, it was not too too late. But you know, I I definitely had you know depression for sure when I transitioned. Well, it's and, and <laughs> what you just said right there is unbelievable. Um, and even it's a, a reminder for myself. You know, um, as a business owner, as a um, whatever it is that my, my new sport, right? It's 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 amazing when you say you know baseball is what you do but it's not who you are you know your company is what you do but it's not who you are um and there's so much power in that because there's freedom in that and i think I when that you follow me mm -hmm. you're free man when you say okay i i play baseball but it's not who i am i think you're going to be you're just free because you're like, you don't have this extra pressure. You know, when we talk about pressure is, what is pressure? Pressure really is what you define as pressure. You know, now there's certain instances in life where life just gives you uh, challenges and pressures, no doubt. But I think sometimes athletes, people, musicians, business owners, moms, dads, fathers, uh, um, husbands, we put pressure on ourselves sometimes that's so unnecessary. Uh, and it's because we, we become so obsessed with what we're doing and we're just trying to do everything right and you lose the freedom. And I think when you lose the freedom, um, you, you're, you're resisting, you know, and you, you know, what resist persists. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's amazing what you just shared there because um, I think kids and athletes uh, and anybody needs to know that they're bigger than what, they, what their career is or um, their sport because there's more to you, you know, like uh, Richard wasn't just a great athlete. Richard's a smart guy. Richard is a leader. Richard can, uh, loves music. Richard loves people. There's, you bring more to the table than just running fast, catching a fly ball and, and hitting a baseball. And, 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 and you know, yeah. there's more to your game. Uh, actually, sometimes I think kid, there's more game there than there was on, on the field, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I figured out for myself. I'm like, dude, you know what? All that stuff, the, all that, that, all that, that, this is like when I talked to you that I had like my epiphany or my enlightened moment. It's like, I said to myself, hold on a minute, all that, all that effort, all that sacrifice. And I've always said, you know, nothing bad comes out of sacrifice was not for baseball. It was preparing me for life, for the challenges, the challenges that awaited me uh, ahead of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you—I've never talked about this, and 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 it's it, it, this was a huge challenge for me. Um, I actually talked about it with Raul Ibanez on, on Wednesday night. We were having we were having a couple of drinks and. I always call him, he's the nicest guy in baseball. He is. We used to hit together. He's got the Memorial. switch, though, so, dude. He's that boy, mm -hmm. a competitor. Mm -hmm. But um, we were talking about, again, this one goes back to Sean, you know, when, so I have two kids, you know. Olivia was always been, uh, she's just a bright, amazing, young, beautiful little girl. And Sean's is, you know, they call him handsome. He's, he's a blonde kid. I always, I, like, this? I always tell my wife, is that my kid? <laughs> um, but, um, no, he's he's always smiling and whatnot. But Sean, at the after after he turned one, every single month, he started to have a fever on the same date consistently, consistently, consistently. So let's say the fever happened on the tenth of every month. It was the tenth every month. You know, as a father, I freaked out. After like month number six, we we're going to the doctor. I said something wrong with my kid. And I remember back then, we were starting uh we, we, i was producing i was like i was like dude i was like talk about you know feeling pressure i would you know commission only starting this whole thing i mean again we started you know, you know big things come from some very small beginnings mm -hmm. uh and watching your son go through this 
this challenge and you're like, man, as a dad, and thank God it wasn't, it wasn't nothing serious. It was a thing called PFAC, periodic fetal syndrome. But dude, when you're sitting in, a, in an infectious disease doctor at Miami Children's Hospital, and you're looking at yourself and say, hold on a minute, man. Is there something, you know, is there going to be something more here? Um, it, 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 it was like a really, really hard thing on me. Fears from, from everywhere. And I look back at that time, and I remember about three times his fever was so high. I took him to the emergency room, and I grabbed his little hand, and he was boiling hot, man. And this little kid would just smile and smile. Um, and somehow I, 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 I'm sure I could have done better, but somehow I ma I, we managed it. I managed it. I managed it as best as I can. Even moments like that, I went back to like what baseball had prepared me for, you know, for tough moments of life, you know? Um, the ability to, to pivot quick, the ability to, to like, hey, there's a curveball, and like, I can make an adjustment. Um, and again, nothing, nothing bad. I mean, Sean never again had, uh, had a fever. He outgrew it and whatnot, but it was scary. That's scary, yeah. It was scary. Because you're not in control and you don't really maybe know. Well, that's when I realized that. I always had, I, I didn't know this about myself until I was told by a psychologist, you're a control freak. I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, well, yeah, you are. Now you're trying to control this, what I'm telling you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, it's all this game, Richard, prepares you in so many ways for the game of life. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't and, agree more. You know what I'm yeah, saying, man? Absolutely. Because uh, I think there's so many facets of the game that we overlook, that we had to deal with, that might seem minuscule in the moment, but they're big. Down the road, you're like, oh, I, I remember dealing with that. Like I look back, for example, and I, I'll never forget this. I was in the middle of my career, and it was, I was in a bad slump. I was probably like three for thirty or something like that, <laughs> where my three hits were like broken bat singles or something like that. And my you it know, happens. I, I, I'm. You're slated as you're probably one of the top one percent of baseball players at that level in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and big number scheme. And I feel like I've never picked up a bat in my life. Like I literally remember sitting in the car and going, "I don't want to go in there today. Like it's it's going to be another day." And then it just starts snowballing, snowballing. And then all of a sudden, and you know this because I know you played a long time, and all the other athletes know it. You know when we get out of our slumps is when we stop giving a shit. Right, whether where are your hands? Where's my feet? Am I on time? All right, let me go work on this drill. Okay, let me talk to this coach, and things spiral out of control. And I think it goes to what, what you're saying is, you can't control everything. Worry about what you can control, because if the I, when I look back, I'm like, why? Why does it take us to get to the point where we stop caring for us to start hitting again, or things to start going our way? And I'm not sure I found out the right answer, but some of the answers that I come up with is because when you stop caring, it's not that you don't love the game. It's not that you're not putting in the work. It's that you're taking a time out from the, from the pressure, from the stress, from the worries, from everything that deals with you know being an athlete. And you stop thinking and you start reacting. Right, and so I think that level of just kind of not giving a shit helps you recover, and then you start building the momentum back up. It's kind of like the hamster on the wheel thing, right? Things start snowballing, going out of control. You don't even know where you're running. You don't even know you're on a wheel right now, and all of a sudden you you step off the wheel, whether you just don't care anymore or you're in control mentally, and you know you need to take a time out and get back to foundational stuff. You can watch the wheel stop. Everything starts to slow down. You start seeing pitches a little better. You start saying, oh, wow, I used to swing at that pitch. Like, or you start getting back to your approach. And then you can get back on the wheel and start the momentum again. And so one thing I always use when I talk to students, and I still talk to the University of Miami School of Business, is you know, I always draw like a huge like, line on a stock chart. right? And then I'll draw like something in the middle, but more you know, in line. Okay. And I'll say, which one's the minor leaguer? And which one's the major leaguer? And people will see like the big high peaks and the valleys like, oh, that guy's, you know, maybe like the top represents like hitting 430 for like, you know, two weeks or whatever. And they're like, oh, that's got to be the big leaguer. And I'm like, okay. I was like, it's not. That's the minor leaguer. 
the big leaguer is the consistent one. The, the person that can never get too high, never get too low. Organizations know what they're getting. So if you're a career 290 hitter, you know, organizations want to call up the guys they know what they can do. For the most part, I'm generalizing. But um, if you're the guy that hits, you know, 380 in this two-week period, and then you hit 180, and then you hit 320, and then you hit 220, the inconsistency kind of tells people when I look back is, you know, you're a streaky player. We don't know what we're going to get. You seem to not be able to control the highs or control the lows. The guys that are consistent, and this goes into the real world, is you can be successful because you're never going to, you might fall down, but you're never going to fall off the cliff. You know, you can have all the success in the world, but you're not going to let it get to your head to you where you know you still have to keep working. And so I think that consistency allows you to sustain success. I feel like athletes, and tell me if I'm wrong, tell me if you feel differently, but athletes, we get so much out of success that we let it get to our heads, and sometimes we can't control it. And that's when we fall really hard. And so I think your ability to control that volatility mm -hmm. um, it leads to consistency, and I think that helps out in the long run. No doubt. And I, and I, and I also think that you know, every single athlete, every single human being has like the little man voice, that little guy who's always in your ear telling you you're not good enough or you're not this. And it's having the ability to, 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 to put that little guy away. <laughs> uh, no, for, it truly is. And I think, I think the athlete that can perform at a high level, you know, I don't know Tom Brady, but I'm going to tell you what I, what, what I from, a, from an outsider looking in, what he exudes is, here's a guy who's won six or seven, seven, seven Super Bowls now. This is a guy who got drafted it wasn't, you know. He's an afterthought. Correct. He's an afterthought. Uh, and he's, in my opinion, he's the best quarterback to ever play, play in the NFL, right? Hands down. Hands down. If you, if you, if you follow Tom Brady or you, and you're kind of familiar with his story, is one of the things that he has that I think is very, very, very special, and I think it's why the game rewards him, is he has a sense of humility uh, that's so respectable and so honorable. Um, and I think that the athletes that, have game, but realize that the game is bigger than them, and that one day you can be here, and the next day you could be here, be there. And the guys who are very aware of that have a—it's kind of like uh, what what's, what 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 do they say? The fear of God is like the beginning of wisdom. Well, the fear of the, the respect of the game, knowing that the game is always going to be big, the program and the game is always going to be bigger than you. The guy who can realize that earlier on is going to be the guy who's going to be more. Uh, successful, mm -hmm. you know. You talk about longevity, no doubt. And 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 look, we live in a world right now where like we have Instagram. Like back when we were playing, we didn't have that, right? Like Thank God. kids, kids have their own Instagram <laughs> page. Like the other day, somebody showed me like it's like a nine year old kid. His dad created his own Instagram page, and he has kids got this following in baseball. And I was like, okay, it's cool, but it's also a very dangerous place in my my opinion, mm -hmm. because now you're making it about him. Right and the identity, who you are, uh, but more importantly is where's that kid's humbleness going to be? Because I looked at every video and I never saw one where he was striking out. Mm -hmm. I only saw where the dad highlighted his his successes. I you know, I think you're setting up a kid for failure. I agree in life. Total, let's for, I, let's put baseball, put sports aside, put that in away. Life, life isn't forgiving. You're life filming all the good sorry. stuff. I want to know. I want to know the. I want to see the strikeout. I want to see, I want to see who that kid is when when shit's not going well. Mm -hmm. You know, is he down? Is he up? Is he okay? That's okay too. That's that's being a part of life. It's like, it's like all these people like in in, in business. You know, uh, the billionaire li uh, lifestyle, and you, you're following some guy, and he's five Ferraris, and well, I love that. I'm all about. I, I love Ferraris too, and you know, garage swing. You know, I I get it. I, I'm, I'm all about prosperity, but. I'm more interested in knowing, you know, what it took to get there. And I think, you know, at least in my career, I've been very blessed to, to be around people who are very wealthy financially and I happen to trust me with their assets and whatnot. And the ones that I respect the most are the ones that are humble, man. I could, I, I agree. They don't even talk about it. They don't know. It's because it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define doesn't matter, them. Right. It doesn't matter to them. Right. I get it. You're not going to maybe post something that's, you know, you're striking out or whatever like that. I mean, I, I get that, but. 
it's the people that like what are they seeing they're seeing everybody else do that they're seeing the guy with the five ferraris and the mansion on the water and they're saying yeah you know i want that but at the same time that doesn't define your identity to have that just because you have the toys doesn't mean you have you know the treasure chest right and so you know it, it i fear that there's not enough exposure out there like you were able to get exposed to you know people that have been successful in wealth that are humble or that don't need to talk about it or they have the toys but they keep them in the garage right and, and for example and so i wonder how many kids are exposed or not exposed to the the humble success stories yeah. because they're is more than one way to do it or get there. And you have to choose what, what you want to do. It's not to say, hey, if you want all the toys in the world because it makes you feel better about yourself and you're grounded in some sort of capacity and that motivates you to be successful, go get it. But it, that just because you see that, because it's flashy, doesn't mean it's the only way to go about it. You know, And I, think, feel, I feel like there might be kids that would rather go this route, but they think in order to be successful because this is what I see, I have to go this route. And the reality is no, go the, go the path that you feel comfortable with. And yeah, you can explore this route, but maybe it's not for you. And if it's not for you, jump ship, right? And you, you live and you learn, you go through experience. But I, I would hope that there's equally enough exposure to the humble success side so people moving forward can make decisions what's best for them. The human side. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I feel like we had that as kids uh, uh, in our era had them. And we, you know, I think... We did have good people around us too, you know. There was there was challenges, but you know, at home and you know, grandparents and, gra- and grandmas kind of keeping keeping these kids uh, keeping these kids level headed uh, and keeping anybody. Uh, you know, there's 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 beauty and humility. There's beauty. In, actually, I actually, you know, talking when you mentioned vulnerability earlier, there's strength in vulnerability, man. But people don't realize it because it's such a negative thing, or they're having something that they are blocking them from being vulnerable. I think strength comes your, your vulnerability will come out when you have strength there's no doubt you know i read a, i read a proverb a couple weeks ago and it stuck with me uh, and i'm gonna say it today it's an, an interesting verse and it says a king protects his sword with kindness and i read that like three times i'm like a king protects his sword with kindness and i was like dude Think about how much power there is in just being a good guy mm-hmm. in kindness, yeah. you know? And even for, for athletes like ourselves who are always on guard and constantly, you know, um, like what you said earlier, like we're just zoomed up at a certain place, how much more power it is if you can actually find, if you can bring yourself to a sense of peace, a sense of of, uh, of, of kindness, of just being kind and, yeah, and, and knowing for, that you're gonna, that you can ball out that way, yeah, and never forgetting who you are and what you came from. I mean, I think a perfect example is, you know, we're still on a threaded text with guys that are still in the big leagues from Miami that you know have had amazing careers, probably more than they ever dreamt about. But yet, we still talk like little kids and give each other shit and go yeah. back and forth, and that keeps like the humbleness in right. check and the importance of of what is important, which is family, friends, and mentors. No doubt. All right, dude. So as we start to wrap this up, what would you tell 18-year-old Richard Giannotti? Um, if you could go back, what would you tell that What would you tell that 18-year-old kid? I'd probably tell him, trust the people that you feel see the world a lot like you and listen to the people that have your best interest in mind and you know continue to keep working hard one thing i will say from a like a physical standpoint is i would have told myself stop looking for the quick fix you know a lot of times as hitters for example we don't feel comfortable, we feel lost, we don't see the ball, and so we change our stance or we change where our hands are and thinking that's gonna be fine and then you might have some instant success and then then you're completely lost instead of just being somewhat lost. You know, so I think sometimes I went for the quick fix and um, I think I learned that later on, but 
you know, it, it's okay to fail as long as you're failing forward and, and learning from your failures. You know, I, I think I, I, I had a lot of great people in my life from Coach Morris and Coach Damari to my coaches in pro ball and trainers and everything like that. And, and I'm so thankful for that. I learned a lot from a lot of people. Um, but I think one important thing that I think I'd like to leave with is you don't have to be identical to A-Rod or Derek Jeter or Tom Brady, even though they're amazing players. But what you can do is take a little bit from each and mold it to how you want to feel, be perceived, and, 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 and have your character resemble because it's it's okay like that's how they got to how be how they were you know you don't have to be i don't have to be Derek jeter to be successful but what makes Derek jeter successful i could probably take a few things from him what has made a rod successful or what has made a rod you know unpopular maybe i don't do certain things there and so you know i think you know it's okay to pick little things from everybody and it doesn't have to be athletes so, you know i have a lot of people in this world no that doubt. successful business people like one of my favorite people, Jimmy Klotz, who's a big uh, uh, donor for, for UM. He's in the, you know, the bond world uh, down here. And he told me one time, he's like, get rid of the negativity. Anybody that's negative, get them out of your life. I don't care if they're somebody that you've known your whole life. Talk to them. Say, hey, listen, I don't want you to be negative around me. And if they keep being negative, get rid of them. And I said, well, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? Like, I thought blood is thicker than water. And you always say, he's like, I don't give a shit. He's like, if you're going to be negative... It's going to affect me for the path I need to continue walking on to be successful. I think there's nothing more powerful than environment. And if one of the things that, that I've always said, if, if you didn't have a good environment, then damn it, build one. And the way that you build it is you have to re- love and respect yourself. And you can still love others with boundaries. And I think that sometimes, specifically even athletes, Guys making millions of dollars, he feels now, he or she now feels that they're responsible for everybody and they're not. The only person that you can control is you. Mm-hmm. You can't control other people's actions. You can't control um, anything other than really how you're going to react to things and how you're going to be. So I think the, what your friend told you is, is, is amazing. And I think what he was telling you is, just, Richard, it's okay to have boundaries. It's actually okay to tell certain people in your family who are not healthy for you, hey, I love you, dude. But I think we have to keep a distance until you're healthy. Because emotional intelligence is huge. Huge. You know, you know what's crazy is, is he told me that probably 15 years ago. And I took it to heart and I implemented it in my life in certain forms or fashion. But I never looked at it the way you just interpreted it. And the way you just interpreted it with it's okay to have boundaries. I think that was what he was really telling me. You know, And I think the fact that it took me 15 years to sit down. And this is why you do stuff like this, right? You learn every day, and so I. Th- I didn't know it was okay to have boundaries. By the way, <laughs> but, but now it's that, the best a, tool in my in, in my in my playbook. That's that's deep, man. I, I, you just made me think differently about something that formed my life, and think differently in a positive way. Yeah. Well, you've been awesome, dude. It's a pleasure to see you. Likewise, my man. Thank you so much for no, coming, Arvish. Listen, if I could say anything, then one of the reasons why I'm here. Obviously, we all go way back, but I've seen what you've been doing with other guys, and their stories are incredible, and and we all are, a lot of us are friends, and, and this isn't just a friend thing, but we've all had same experiences, but different roads and hurdles and, and walls to climb over, and I think it the more stuff you put out there, you know, the, the more it helps, you know, one person at a time, and I just keep doing what you're doing, man, because I love it, and I'm a big fan, and thank you, know, you this so is, this much. This is important. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for letting me, you know, catch up with no you. No doubt. Well, I can't wait to to have it out. Thank you. It's a wrap, boys. <laughs>